Hey guys, Brian Kelly here from Zombie Guitar. Today's video is my 285th YouTube upload. And if you've been following my channel for a while, you probably know that I use the Circle of Fifths in almost every single one of my videos. I would say that at least 250 of my 285 videos use the Circle of Fifths to teach the concept that the video is about. This is one of the most useful tools in all of music theory. That is why I have it tattooed on my forearm here. I'm sure you guys have seen that. In this video, I'm going to give you 16 practical applications for the Circle of Fifths. All right, so the reason that I like the two circle version of the circle of fifths is because the outer circle displays the major chords, the inner circle displays the minor chords. That also represents the major version of each key and the minor version of each key. In music, there's different perspectives as to how many keys there are. I did a video that goes through all of the different perspectives as to how many keys are in music. You can check that video out. I'll put a link to that one below. I like to go with the 12 key model. That is just my preference. That's the easiest way to think about music in my opinion. In the 12 key model, pick a key, one of the 12 keys. There's a major version of that key and then there's a minor version of that key. The major version has a happier sound to it. The minor version has a sadder sound to it. So take C major and A minor, for example. In the key of C major, all of the notes are going to be exactly the same as the notes of the key of A minor. And all of the chords that are found in the key of C major are going to be the same exact chords that are found in the key of A minor. So the major key and its relative minor counterpart share the exact same stuff. It's just that if you say, okay, this is the key of C major, it's going to have a happier sound. When you play music, you write music based around that C major being your home, your tonal center. Same thing, if you take that same exact stuff, all of those same chords, all the, all the same notes, and you say, okay, A minor is my home. A minor is going to be my tonal center chord. I'm going to write music using this stuff, but everything is going to revolve around the A minor chord. It's going to sound sadder. So you can easily determine the chords that are found in any given key simply by using your circle of fifths and looking at the grouping of six that are surrounding the key in question. So if you want to know what the chords are in the key of, say, A major, you have this grouping of six right here. These are your chords that are in the key of A major. The minor version of this key would be F sharp minor. All right, so if you want to write music and you want it to be happier sounding, let's do that right now. Let's just use some chords from this key. I'm just going to write a song in A major. So that was a song in A major. I used most of these chords. Everything that I used was right within this grouping of six, nothing outside of it. So everything was in the key of A major. So if I want to write like a sadder song or something like that in the same key, I'm just going to make the F sharp minor chord to be my home, my tonal center. So let's try that out. Same grouping of six, same chords that I'm pulling from. I was just like, okay, F sharp minor, that's going to be my home chord, that's my tonal center. I'm ending the song on that, leaving the listener with just like a darker type of feeling, all right? So, uh, yeah, that's the grouping of six trick for uh, the circle of fifths. It works for all 12 keys. All right, so what is a key? A key is just seven notes that you use to write music with to write in that key. So you take those seven notes and you can create chords out of it. You know, as long as you only stick to those seven notes and you don't use any outside notes, then you're playing 100% in that key. How do you determine the seven notes that are in the key in question? Well, you can use your circle of fifths to do that. So in order to do this, you start with the note that represents the key in question. So let's say we're trying to determine what the seven notes are for the key of A major. So you're going to start on the A. That's going to be one of the seven notes, obviously. Then you're going to go in the counterclockwise direction and that's going to be one of your other seven notes. Then you're going to go in the clockwise direction until there's a total of seven notes. So that's your seven notes for the key of A major. 
So your seven notes in the key of A major are going to be A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp. Those are the seven notes for the key signature of A major. Now you're going to notice that, you know, once you get to the bottom of the circle, there's a D flat there and there's an A flat there. Keep in mind that, you know, you have what is known as enharmonic equivalence. So D flat is the same note as C sharp. A flat is the same note as G sharp. We're going to talk more about sharps and flats coming up in this video if you're a little bit confused about what I'm talking about here, but just bear with me. And then of course this exact same information applies to the key of F sharp minor because the key of A major and the key of F sharp minor are a relative major minor pair, meaning that they share the exact same seven notes. They're the same key signature. So if you want to know what the notes of the key of F sharp minor are, you do this exact same thing. Those are your seven notes for the key of A major. Those are your seven notes for the key of F sharp minor. All right, so let's talk about that sharps and flats thing. So when we looked at the key of A major, I said that there's sharps in it. Why did I use sharps and why didn't I use flats? Circle of fifths gives you that information. So everything that's on the right side of the circle, those are going to be keys that use sharps. Everything that's on the left side of the circle, those are going to be keys that use flats. So the key of A major has sharps in it. The key of B major has sharps in it. The key of F sharp minor has sharps in it. The key of B minor has sharps in it. So if you go on to the other side of the circle of fifths, the left side, that's going to be your flat keys. So that applies to both the major keys and their respective relative minors. Then the one at the very bottom could be considered either the key of F sharp or the key of G flat. They're both the same thing. It's just that if you call it the key of F sharp, it's going to use sharps. It's going to contain six sharps in it. If you write it out as the key of G flat, it's going to contain flats. It's going to have six flats in it. In any of the 12 keys, there are going to be three major chords found in that key, three minor chords found in that key, and then you're going to have one diminished triad. When I'm using the circle of fifths, the one that has the outer circle and the inner circle, and we look at this grouping of six, there's only major chords and minor chords in the grouping of six. There's no diminished chords. In order to do this, you do the thing where you determine your seven notes for the key in question, and then you just look at the very last one in the clockwise direction, and that's going to be what your diminished chord is. So let's say that we want to know what the diminished chord is in the key of C major or A minor. You do your, you know, start on the C, one to the counterclockwise direction, five in the clockwise direction, the one at the very end in the clockwise direction, there's that B right there. That's your answer. So you can also use the circle of fifths to determine your pentatonic notes. So the pentatonic scale is just five notes. Those five notes are five of the seven total notes of the key. So the key of C major has seven notes. The key of A minor has those same seven notes. It's just called either C major or A minor, same seven notes. Five of those seven notes is the pentatonic scale. So if you want to determine what your C major pentatonic notes are or your A minor pentatonic notes, which are going to be the exact same five notes, you can use the circle of fifth to do this. There's two ways to do this. Number one, start on the note C, counterclockwise by one, clockwise by five. That gives you your seven notes for the key in question. Cross out the ones on both ends, all the way on the counterclockwise direction and the clockwise direction. Cross those two notes out. The five remaining notes, those are your pentatonic notes. That's your C major pentatonic scale notes. That's your A minor pentatonic scale notes. That's the first way. So the second way to make this determination will be to start with your grouping of six. So we're going to stick with the same key here. We're going to stick with the key of C major slash A minor. You have your grouping of six. So instead of looking at these as chords, we're just going to look at them as individual notes. So C, F, G, A, D, E. So we want to determine what the five pentatonic notes are. So in order to do this, based on the grouping of six, you simply cross out the one that's in the outer circle counterclockwise position, which in this case is F. So cross out the F, the five remaining notes, those are your pentatonic notes. This gives you your C major pentatonic scale notes. This gives you your A minor pentatonic scale notes. Same five notes, relative major minor pair. Major triads, minor triads. You want to know the notes of any of the 12 major triads or any of the 12 minor triads. These are also just called chords. So 12 major chords, 12 minor chords. It's the same thing. What are the three notes that make up a C major chord? C, E, and G. Using your circle of fifths, this forms a little triangle. So you have your C. Don't consider this an E minor. We're just considering these individual notes now. So the note C, the note E, and the note G. Those are your notes for a C major chord. 
what are the notes that make up a D major chord? D, F sharp, and A. There's your little triangle cluster. What are the notes that make up an E flat major chord? E flat, G, B flat. Same little triangle cluster. So what about for minor chords? otherwise known as minor triads. It's the same thing, it's still gonna form a little triangle cluster, it's just the triangle is gonna be configured a bit differently. So what are the notes that make up a G minor chord, for example? So you have a G, you have a B flat, and you have a D. That little triangle cluster, that gives your answer. What about an A minor chord? A, C, E, little triangle cluster. This works for all 12 major chords, all 12 minor chords. So this right here is typically what people talk about first when they give circle of fifths presentations. So um, the number of sharps or flats in any given key. So how many sharps or flats are in the key of C major? There are zero. The one at the very top of the circle that says there's no sharps or no flats in that particular key. Moving in the clockwise direction, you add a sharp each time. So in the key of G, the seven notes that make up the key of G major or the key of E minor, relative major minor pair, they're going to share the same exact seven notes as one another. That particular key is going to have one sharp in it. It's going to have six natural notes and one sharp in it. The key of D major, which shares the same seven notes as the key of B minor, that's going to have two sharps in it. The next key in that direction is going to have three sharps. The next key is going to have four sharps. Until you get to the bottom, that's going to have six sharps. So then we have the flat keys. So again, you start at the top, you have your key of C major slash A minor, that's the key that has no sharps, no flats in it. One in the counterclockwise direction, you have your key of F major, which has the relative minor of D minor. Those two keys share the exact same seven notes as one another. That key has one flat in it. Move in that same direction by one, that key has two flats in it. Keep going, you have three flats, then four flats, then five flats. Then you get to the bottom, that's the key of G flat, that has six flats in it. All right, so the key of G major has one sharp in it. Cool. What is the note that's made sharp? How do you know what that is? Or the key of A major has three sharps in it. Cool. How do you know what those notes are that are made sharp in the key of A major? Use your circle of fists to make this determination. So for the key of G, we know that the key of G major has one sharp in it. So go to the G, you go back two. Go in the counterclockwise direction by two. F, that's the note that's made sharp in the key of G major key of G major or the G major scale, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. That's your G major scale. That's your key signature for that particular key. Um, what about for the key of D major? What are the, we know that D major has two sharps in it. All right, so what are the notes that are made sharp in the key of D major? All right, so you have your F and then you go one more in the clockwise direction. So the notes F and the notes C are going to be the two notes that are made sharp in the key of D major. The key of A major, we know that A major contains three sharps. What notes are made sharp in the key of A major? Start on the F, clockwise one, there's your C, clockwise one, there's your G. The key of A major has three sharps in it. Those are your three sharps, all right? You see the pattern here? So that's for sharps. All right, so now for the flat keys. Starting at the top, you have your key of C major that has no sharps, no flats in it. Moving in the counterclockwise direction, your key of F major which is the same key signature as D minor, that has one flat in it. What note is flat? Which is the flat note? The answer is B flat. So keep moving in the counterclockwise direction. What are the flat notes in the key of B flat major slash G minor? What are the two flat notes that are found in that particular key? The answer is B flat and E flat. Moving along, what are the three flats that are found in the key of E flat major slash C minor? What are the three flats? B flat, E flat, A flat. So the pattern keeps going as you continue to move around the circle in the counterclockwise direction, and that's how you determine which notes are made flat. All right, so dominant chords, otherwise known as seventh chords. If you see a chord symbol that says something like C7, that's a C dominant seven chord. Or if you see something that says like G7, that's a G dominant seven chord. So you see a chord symbol that just has a seven after it. You don't see any major or anything like that. Like it's not a G major seven or a G major seven or a G minor seven. It's just G seven, dominant chord. Dominant chords have this tension to them, all right? And this tension wants to move to something. And the something that it wants to move to 
is the chord that's directly next to it on the circle of fifths in the counterclockwise direction. So let's say that we have a G7 chord, or a G dominant 7 chord. Sounds something like this. The thing that it wants to move to is the C chord. That's the chord that's right next to it on the circle of fifths in the counterclockwise direction. So we'll play a G dominant 7 chord followed by a C major chord. Tension, release. Dominant chords are tension. The chord right in the counterclockwise direction to it, release. So this also applies to minor chords as well. So dominant chords, which have tension, can also be released by playing a minor chord directly after it. Let's say that our goal chord is an F sharp minor. So this is our release, F sharp minor. So what would be the dominant seventh chord to play right before that that causes the tension? So you can look at your circle of fifths, find your F sharp minor chord, right in the clockwise direction to it, you see C sharp minor, right? But it's not a C sharp minor chord that we wanna play, it's a dominant seventh chord that we wanna play. Dominant seventh chords are what create that tension. So if our, if our resolution is an F sharp minor chord, a C sharp dominant seven chord is going to be the tension chord. So let's play a C sharp dominant seven chord, something like this. Works for major chords, works for minor chords. All right, so numbering chord progressions. You may have seen things or heard things before, like that's a one, five, six, four progression, or that's a two, five, one progression, or something like that. This can all be determined on the circle of fifths based on the grouping of six. It doesn't matter which key you're in, it's just the grouping of six, it's always gonna be the same. So if we want to determine what a one, five, six, four chord progression is in the key of C, it's gonna be the exact same location within the grouping of six as it would be for the key of G or the key of E or whatever. So your one, let's, let's go to the uh, key of C major slash A minor just to start out with. Your one is always gonna be outer circle center position. Your two is always gonna be inner circle counterclockwise. Three is gonna be inner circle clockwise. Four is outer circle counterclockwise. Five is outer circle clockwise. Six is inner circle center position. If I wanna play a one, five, six, four chord progression in the key of C major, I can do this using this grouping of six. One, five, six, four. That's a one, five, six, four chord progression in the key of C major. What if I wanna play a one, five, six, four chord progression in the key of D major? Same exact thing, same location within the grouping of six. This is how you transpose music from one key to another key very, very easily. So you can also use this grouping of six information to help you out with modes and modal chord progressions and all that kind of stuff. So all that a mode is, is it's another perspective of a key signature. All right, so, so far up until now, we've been looking at two perspectives of key signatures. So when you write music in the key of C major and you use all of the stuff from the key of C major and you're saying, all right, the C major chord is my home chord, that's my tonal center. We're using all of the chords. You don't have to use all of the chords, but we're using only chords that are found in this particular key. But the tonal center, the home chord, the chord that's most likely gonna be the last chord played in the song is gonna be a C major chord. Everything being centered around that chord, that's called Ionian. So that's another name for a major key, Ionian. The sound that is produced from a major key is the Ionian mode sound which comes from making your tonal center to be that chord right there, the chord that's in the center position, outer circle. You can use the exact same stuff, the exact same notes, the exact same chords from this particular key signature, but instead of making the C major chord to be home, your tonal center, make the A minor chord to be home. 
as a result, the music is going to sound sadder. It's going to have a different sound overall. That sound that you're hearing, that sadder, darker sound, is known as the Aeolian mode sound. That comes from making that chord in the inner circle center position, your tonal center within the key signature. You can also make any of these other chords within your key signature to be your tonal center as well, and that's what modes are. So, inner circle counterclockwise position, Dorian. Inner circle clockwise position, Phrygian. Outer circle counterclockwise, Lydian. Outer circle clockwise, Mixolydian. And then you have that seventh chord that's in the key that's not found in the grouping of six. That diminished chord, that's going to be your Locrian mode. So as we just talked about, modes are sounds. Ionian mode has this happier, brighter type of sound to it. The Aeolian mode, otherwise known as a minor key, has a darker type of sound to it. All right, so one is brighter, one is darker. All of the seven modes have a certain level of brightness to it, or a certain level of darkness to it. And the circle of fifths organizes this in the exact order from brightness to darkness. Start on the note C, go one in the counterclockwise direction, go five in the clockwise direction. That gives you your seven notes for the key signature of C major. We've already talked about that in this video. So the brightest of the modes is going to be the F, F Lydian. The next brightest is going to be C, C Ionian. The next brightest is G Mixolydian. Then you have D Dorian. Then you have A Aeolian. Then you have E Phrygian. Then you have B Locrian. So those are your seven modes for the key signature of C major organized from brightest to darkest. So, so far we've been talking a lot about playing in one single key. That's that whole grouping of six thing. In the grouping of six, you have your three major chords, three minor chords that are found in your key. But a lot of times in music, you're not just always going to stick to just the chords that are found in your key. Those are going to be most of the chords that are going to take place in the music, but there's going to be some outside chords thrown in just to kind of make things more interesting. So where do those outside chords come from? More often than not, they're going to be what is known as borrowed chords. So for this example, we're going to play in the key of C major slash A minor, and we're going to borrow some chords from the parallel key of C minor. So the key that we're playing in is the key of C major, but we just want some outside chords to pull from just to kind of make things more interesting. So we're going to look to the parallel key. It's called C minor, C major, C minor. On the circle of fifths, that's going to be your neighboring grouping of six. We now have this new pool of chords to pull from. So I'm just going to give you one quick example here, and I'm going to borrow the B flat chord and the A flat chord from this neighboring key. So you can also borrow chords in the other direction too. You could say that your initial starting key is the key of A minor. You can call this initial starting key the key of C major. You can call it the key of A minor. Call it whatever you want. So if we're calling it A minor, then the parallel key would be A major. So the chords for the key of A major are in the grouping of six in the other direction. So now we have this other grouping of six from which we can pull chords from. So let's try to do something there. Just another quick example right there. I didn't even use an A minor chord there, but I was just calling the key signature. I was just saying that it was A minor borrowing from the parallel key of A major. I just It just gave me another grouping of six chords to pull from. All right, so finally we have intervals. So intervals are things like perfect fifth, perfect fourth, minor third, major third, things like that. So you can use the circle of fifths to determine your intervals, and it's always going to be the same no matter which note you start on. So the outer circle of the circle of fifths, there's 12 spots on it. Each one of those 12 spots represents one of the 12 notes that we have to start on. So let's say we want to start on the note C. 
So starting on the note C, and I want to determine what a perfect fifth above C is. Well, I just go one in the clockwise direction. A perfect fifth above C is the note G. That's going to work for any note that you start on. If I start on the note A, what's a perfect fifth above A? The answer is E. It's always going to be one in the clockwise direction. I'm just going to use C for all the examples, but this is going to work for any of the 12 possible starting notes. The relationship to the starting note is always going to be the same. So starting on C, a perfect fifth is in the clockwise direction. A perfect fourth above C is in the counterclockwise direction. So a perfect fourth above C is the note F. Starting on C, a major second above C is the note D. Starting on C, a minor seventh above C is the note B flat. So expanding out a little bit more, again, starting on C as our reference note, a major sixth above C is going to be the note A. A minor third above the note C is going to be the note E flat. And then moving out a little bit more, C is our starting point. So a major third above the note C is going to be the note E. A minor sixth above the note C is going to be the note A flat. Moving out a little bit more, C is our starting point, so a major seventh above C is going to be the note B. And a minor second above C is going to be the note D flat. And then finally we have what is known as a tritone, and that is directly across on the circle of fifths. So the note C, the tritone, this is also known as a flat five interval, or a sharp four interval. This is that, uh, the devil's interval it's sometimes called. It's the most dissonant interval that there is that's directly across from the reference note. So C and then F sharp, that's a tritone. So far we've talked about intervals in relation to the C, uh, intervals in the upwards direction. So uh, a, a major second above the note C would be the note D. A uh, major third above the note C would be the note E. A uh, perfect fifth above the note C would be the note G. So, so far, everything that I've given you was intervals above the original starting note. There's also below, all right? So, what's a perfect fifth below C? What's a major second below C? What's a minor seventh below C? So, this is where things get confusing. So, for every perfect fifth above it's also going to be a perfect fourth below. For every perfect fourth above, it's also going to be a perfect fifth below. It's easiest to, to visualize this on a piano. Start on the note C on a piano. Only focus on the white notes. Forget about all the black notes. Start on the note C. Count up five notes in the C major scale, which is just the white notes. C, D, E, F, G. So a perfect fifth above C, you're going to end on the note G. Start on the note C and count down until you get to the G. So C, B, A, G. So counting down, it's only four below C. So G is five above C. G is also four below C. So that's why it's a perfect fifth above C, a perfect fourth below C. F, start on the note C. F is a perfect fourth above, but a perfect fifth below. So this reciprocal thing is going to be true no matter how far along the circle you are away from the original starting note. The note D is a major second above C. The note B flat is a minor seventh above C. So the reciprocal is also true. So the note D is going to be a minor seventh below. The note B flat is going to be a major second below. All right, so the reciprocal holds true. And this is true the entire way around the circle. So fourths and fifths, those are reciprocal intervals with one another. Major second, minor sevenths, those are reciprocals. Minor thirds, major sixth. Major thirds, minor sixth. Major sevenths and minor seconds. Tritones are perfectly symmetrical. So there is no reciprocal interval with that one. I think this video is getting long enough for today, though. That's going to uh, do it. So I hope you guys like this one. I love the circle of fifths. I highly recommend that you get it tattooed on your arm. If you do, get it tattooed on your strumming hand. That way, when you're fretting chords, you can still hold down the chord. And then you can refer to your circle of fifths on your arm. And then get back to strumming.
So I hope you guys enjoyed it. See you later. Thank you.